Well, thanks, Andy. Thanks, uh, Dara and Milo, for leading us in worship. And good morning. Now, when I was 18, I was lucky enough to uh, visit Central America. And on one occasion, I went on a trip with some friends to the jungle. And we came to this amazing place. There was this river running through the jungle. And this place, the, the river opened out into these deep uh, pools. Um, they were all connected by these beautiful waterfalls. It was an amazing place. It was kind of like a tropical and warm version of the fairy pools on the Isle of Skye, if anyone's been there. And on one side of the pools, there was this steep cliff. And when we arrived, there were other tourists like ourselves. They were climbing up the cliff and jumping down into the pools. And we thought this looked like great fun. So my friend Tom and I, we started doing the same thing. And it soon became a little bit competitive in that we were kind of daring one another to go higher and higher up the cliff and jump down into the pools. And then after a few jumps, Tom pointed much further up the cliff and he pointed to this particularly big tree that was growing out of the cliff almost at right angles. And there was this kind of unspoken challenge between us and we excitedly started scrambling up the cliff higher and higher and higher until we reached this tree. Now, Tom got there first. He was obviously a better climber than I was. And he started shuffling out along one of the biggest overhanging branches. Now, I should say this tree was definitely high enough that you needed to be very careful how you hit the water below. You wanted to hit with your feet, break the surface of the water with your feet so that you went in like an arrow. So Tom started lowering himself down from this branch until he was just hanging there by his hands. And then he looked over at me and said something like, See you down there and let go. And he was in the air for what felt like a long time before he hit the water. And I was kind of peering over the edge of the cliff to see if he was all right. And thankfully, he came to the surface, gave me a little thumbs up. And I thought, brilliant, it's it's my turn. Here we go. And I started excitedly shuffling out along this branch. And I was almost at the end when something odd happened. I just stopped moving. Like my body literally would not move. It was like somebody had just very suddenly poured concrete into my muscles and I was just totally stuck. Like a few minutes before I'd been the picture of confidence. I'd been scrambling up the cliff laughing and joking and all of a sudden this confidence had just totally drained out of me and it just left me stuck. I couldn't go forwards. I couldn't go back. I tried shuffling back along the branch but I I just I just couldn't. I was just stuck sitting in the tree. I even managed to attract a crowd of onlookers below, which really didn't help my state of mind. And um, it was just dreadful. Just the the next few minutes just crept by. I was just kind of sitting there. Uh, it, it It was bizarre. I just couldn't do anything. Now, eventually, with the help of Tom, he was shouting up instructions and encouragements to me. Eventually, I summoned the courage to to kind of start lowering myself down until I was just hanging from my hands like he had been, which was a great step. But of course, then I couldn't let go. So I was just kind of dangling there like some weird Christmas tree ornament. And I honestly think if my fingers hadn't involuntarily let go about 30 seconds later, I would probably still be hanging there in that tree today. But thank goodness they did. And I dropped down into the pool and uh, I was, I landed safely. It hurt a little bit. I won't be, I won't lie to you, but I landed safely. I was so glad I had done it and I lived to tell the tale. So today we are finishing our series called Guard Your Heart. Over the past four weeks, we've been looking to God's word to help us navigate this emotional and stressful season of adjustment that we all find ourselves in as a result of the pandemic. Today we're asking for help when I have lost confidence. Confidence is a strange thing. We can find ourselves having sudden crises of confidence like I did in the tree halfway up the cliff. Or our confidence can be slowly eroded over time almost without us realizing it. Either way, the result is that we get stuck. We find ourselves reluctant or unable to take action and step out in new things or try new things. We become hesitant and passive and fearful. And so we we shrink back. Now, if you're a bit low on confidence right now, it's no wonder. 
So many of the things that we habitually find confidence in have been shaken over these past six months. It could be your, your job or your social life or your health. Or perhaps it's not down to coronavirus at all, but you just don't see yourself as a naturally confident person. And this is something you've been struggling with for much longer than the past six months. Confidence is so important because without it, we just can't live life to the full. We shy away from opportunities and challenges. And this leads to frustration and dissatisfaction, ultimately. Low confidence can even discourage us from responding to the call of God on our lives. This is not the way God wants it to be. And this morning, I believe he wants to give you a new unshakable confidence that will last. The Bible is filled with characters who face crises of confidence. Elijah, Gideon, Joshua, even Jesus' most outwardly confident disciple, Peter, they all faced these dramatic moments where they completely lost their self-assurance. And we could look at any of them this morning, but instead we're going to focus on Moses. Now, Moses has gone down in history as one of Israel's most famous leaders. But when God first called him to lead, his confidence was at rock bottom. And we can learn so much from the way that God led him through that. So Moses was a Hebrew, but um, he enjoyed the upbringing of a prince in Egypt. And you can imagine that that came with plenty of self-confidence. But one day, he made a big mistake. He killed a man and was forced to flee to the wilderness, where he ended up living for 40 years, just tending sheep. He'd gone from living the dream in a palace to being a nobody in the middle of nowhere. This is when he encountered God in a burning bush. So we're going to read from Exodus chapter 3. I'll be skipping a few verses, so hopefully, hopefully you'll be able to uh, follow along on the screen. God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place in which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you and they will listen to your voice and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my mighty hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. Then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. The Lord, and the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it and it became a staff in his hand that they may believe the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. God then shows uh, Moses two more miracles just to really make his point. After that, Moses said to the Lord, oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent 
either in the past or since you've spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, oh my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses and he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he's coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people and he shall be your mouth and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hands this staff with which you shall do the signs. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, let me return to my own people in Egypt. So Moses just didn't feel like he had it in him to do what was being asked of him. Have you ever been asked to do something that you felt was beyond you? I know I have. Perhaps you can also identify with Moses in chapter 4, verse 13, when he says, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. It's so interesting to see how God responds and helps Moses move forward into new confidence. At every turn in this long story that we read, God urges Moses not to look at his own weaknesses, but instead to trust entirely in God. That's very different to what the world tells us that we need to do when we're lacking in confidence. The mantra is, you've just got to believe in yourself and then you'll be able to conquer anything. Muhammad Ali, the great boxer said, to be a great champion, you must believe you are the best. If you're not, pretend you are. People apply that same idea to life. If you only tell yourself that you've got this enough, that you'll eventually find it in yourself to triumph. But deep down, we know that this isn't always true. It might work some of the time. Sure, Muhammad Ali became heavyweight champion for a while, but he lost his last two professional fights and then had to retire from the sport because of his deteriorating health. No amount of pretending was good enough to keep winning. And we will all face our own limitations eventually. You can always find the answers that you need within yourself. If we're ultimately drawing our confidence from our own strength or our own circumstances or from our job or how other people see us or from our finances or our social skills or our appearance or even the latest coronavirus statistics, we will find that our well of confidence keeps running dry again and again. You know, Muhammad Ali was half right. Belief is the key to confidence, but it's not belief in ourselves. It's belief in God. Belief in God and what he can do through us. God doesn't try to convince Moses that he's underestimated himself and that he really can do it after all. He says something far better. He graciously invites him to draw from a well of confidence that never runs dry from God alone. So here are four things that God asks Moses to be confident in. And I believe he's asking you to place your confidence in these things this morning too. Firstly, God tells, God tells Moses to stop focusing on his own shortcomings and to focus on who he is instead. He tells him his name. God says to Moses, I am who I am. Tell them, I am has sent me to you. You know, God's names are incredibly important because they reveal his character, what he's like. If you want to know whether God is worthy of your trust this morning, look at his names. His name here is I am who I am. It's uh, Yahweh in Hebrew. In giving this name, God is saying, I'm not limited like you are. I am and will be the eternally constant God. I stand ever present and unchangeable, completely sufficient in myself to do all that I have decided that I want to accomplish. 
we don't have to live life pretending that we are like God. We're limited and weak, and that's okay because he is unlimited and unimaginably strong. Here are some other names that God gives himself in the Bible, and this is by no means an, exhaust, uh, an exhaustive list. Elroy means the one who sees me. God knows you. He's not distant from you. He cares about you, and he's watching over you today. Yahweh Yaira, which means the Lord will provide. God knows your needs, and he can be trusted to provide for you. You know, you can trust him for everything that you need. Even when you face death itself, he has provided eternal life for you through his son, Jesus, when you put your faith in him. Yahweh Rophe, the Lord heals. Maybe you need healing, spiritually, emotionally, or physically. You can confidently ask the God who is strong enough to heal. Yahweh Shalom, the Lord is peace. Fear and anxiety just seem to surround us these days, don't they? And that erodes our confidence. The antidote to that is to encounter our God who is peace. Here's a good one. Multiple times, God calls himself the Hebrew name Ish, which means husband. He is the ideal husband to his people. He's perfectly loving, perfectly compassionate. He is always faithful and he will be by your side forever. If that doesn't give you confidence, I don't know what will. Finally, Jesus, which of course means savior. We all need a savior, and in Jesus, we have a savior, a perfect savior, who we can rely on completely. So the more we learn about the names of God, the more we will understand his character. And the better we know God, the more confident that we will be. God wants you to get to know him better. He's inviting you into a deeper, more intimate relationship with him today. The second thing that God urges Moses to be confident in is the promises of God. Moses protests, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And God's response is a promise. I will be with you, he says. This is a promise repeated again and again in the Bible. God will never leave you. Maybe you need to be reminded of that this morning. Maybe that's something you really need to hear. God is not going to leave you. He is with you today. The Bible's littered with promises that God has made to you and to me. We could spend all day going through them. But why not make it your mission this week to seek out some of these promises in Scripture? Get to know them well and write them down. Memorize them or pray them back to God. In tough times, I've drawn so much confidence, so much strength from just hanging on to things that God has promised in his word. I love Peter's testimony at the start of our service this morning. He put his confidence in the promises of God in Psalm 23, and that transformed his situation. But this is a fight. We've got to fight to hang on to these promises. We have to fight to keep believing that God will do what he says he'll do. So I want to encourage you, keep fighting. Keep fighting to believe in the promises of God because they are sure and dependable and you can find your confidence in them. Thirdly, God tells Moses to have confidence in his power. God didn't expect Moses to rely on himself. Instead, he gave him miraculous signs of his power to back up his promises. We read about the first one of those when he turned uh, Moses' staff into a snake. God's power is available to us if only we would ask him. I was reminded of a story I read about Watchman Nee, who was a Chinese missionary in the early 20th century. He and his friends had been preaching their hearts out to a remote island community without much of a response because the islanders worshipped an idol called Ta Wang. Let me read, you, read that story to you. On January 9th, we were outside preaching. Brother Wu, with some others, was in one part of the village and suddenly asked publicly, why will none of you believe? Someone in the crowd replied at once, we have a god, one god, Ta Wang. And he's never failed us. He is an effective God. 
How do you know that you can trust him? Asked Wu. We have held his festival procession every January for 286 years. The chosen day is revealed by divination beforehand, and every year, without fail, his day is a perfect one without rain or cloud, was the reply. When is the procession this year? It's fixed for January the 11th at 8 in the morning. Then, said Brother Wu impetuously, I promise you that it will rain on the 11th. At once there was an outburst of cries from the crowd. That is enough. We don't want to hear any more preaching. If there is rain on the 11th, then your God is God. We stopped our preaching at once and gave ourselves to prayer. So Watchman Nee and his friends knew that uh, the islanders were fishermen. They were experts at predicting the weather. So only a miracle could have kept rain away on the 11th of January or only a miracle would have brought rain, rather, on the 11th of January. So for two days, they just gave themselves to prayer, asking God that he would bring rain and prove that he was the real God. Watchman Nee says, I was awakened by the direct rays of the sun through the single window of our attic. This isn't rain, I said. It was already past seven o'clock. I got up, knelt down and prayed, Lord, I said, please send the rain. Even before our amen, we heard a few drops on the tiles. Soon we heard what had happened in the village. Already at the first drops of rain, a few of the younger generation had begun to say openly, there is a God, there is no more Ta Wang. He is kept in by the rain. But he wasn't. They carried him out on a sedan chair. Surely he would stop the shower. Then came the downpour. After only some 10 or 12 yards, three of the coolies stumbled and fell. Down went the chair and Ta Wang with it, fracturing his jaw and his left arm. Still determined, they carried out emergency repairs and they put him back in the chair. Somehow, slipping and stumbling, they dragged or carried him halfway round the village. And then the floods defeated them. The procession was stopped and the idol taken into a house. Divination was made. Today was the wrong day, came the answer. The festival is to be on the 14th with the procession at six in the evening. Immediately we heard this. There came the assurance in our hearts. God will send rain on the 14th. And of course, he did. You know, sometimes we need to be aware of our own weakness to make space for the power of God, the kind of power that we just read about, to be at work through us. God told the Apostle Paul, my power is made perfect in weakness. Instead of trying to manufacture self-confidence, let's boldly ask God for his power instead. Finally, we must have confidence because God himself has called us by name. He calls us for purpose. He doesn't want us to lack in confidence and find ourselves stuck. Look at the opening of the passage we read today. God called Moses by name. He could have asked anyone to lead his people, but he very deliberately and personally chose Moses. If you're a Christian this morning, it's not by accident. It's not just because of a choice that you made. It's because God has called you by name, and he wants to lovingly draw you into his purposes. And you know, if you are not a Christian and you are watching this, I believe God is calling your name this morning. Don't shy away from that. Don't ignore it. If that's you, I'd love to speak with you after this service or during the week. You can email me, um, it's, you can just email the contribution email address, hello at kingschurchedinburgh.org, or put Chris in front of that, and you can get in touch with me. I'd love to chat some more with you. It should give us all the confidence that we need to know that the God of the universe has called each of us by name, and he has things prepared beforehand for us to do with him. Some of you have lost confidence, and it's led you to back off from God and from the things that he has called you into, that you know he's called you to. Perhaps the coronavirus pandemic has played into that. It's made you fearful. 
it's maybe made you put things on pause or just lower your expectations of what God wants to do through you in this season right now. I be- really believe that God wants to recommission you this morning. He wants to recommission you to run your race for him, whatever the circumstances look like, and to believe him for great things again. You know, our defining characteristic as Christians, first and foremost, before anything else, is that we are people who believe God. I know that sounds simple. (laughs) Sounds like stating the obvious. But I really think there's something in that that we really need to dig into this morning. We are people of faith. We are people who believe God. We put all our trust in him. We believe that he is who he says he is, that he keeps all of his promises, and that he's infinitely powerful. And we believe that when we step out in faith, in response to him, that he always will meet us in that place. He will never leave us. I want to leave you with the words of God spoken through his prophet, Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah 17. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Maybe 2020 has felt like a year of drought to you so far. Well, here is a promise that you can hang on to. When we put our confidence in God, not only will he see you through, he will also make you fruitful, even in this season, even right now. Let's thank him for that amazing truth and put all our confidence in God as we sing to him now.